Good morning, everyone. I believe we're going to get started. Uh, it's a little after nine. I will mention to you up front in, in getting ready to launch this morning, we had a little bit of technical difficulty, so hopefully things will work out this morning. So let me take the opportunity to say again, good morning and welcome to spring 2021 convocation. It's great to be with all, you all this morning. We right now are at about 250 participants and growing, which is fantastic. I wanted to let you know that I had invited uh, Gaga and JLo and Garth to be with us this morning, but unfortunately they apparently got a better offer yesterday. So all kidding aside, I am gonna challenge our commencement planning committee to secure poet laureate Amanda Gorman as a future commencement speaker. All I can say is wow, wow, wow. I was moved beyond tears when she spoke. So John Hornack and Keith Rosenthal, I'm willing to put out, pull out the big checkbook on this one. So let's see if we can make this happen in the future. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, let's take the opportunity to do some of our customary welcomes and introductions. Next slide. First of all, I believe we are joined. If you look in the body of who is here, you may see some of these uh, esteemed trustees with us this morning. Of course, we have Wandine Trainer, Stephanie O'Brien, Diana Conti, Suzanne Crow, Eva Long, and uh, Phil Cranenberg, and our newest trustee, uh, Dr. Paul De Silva. So, Paul, welcome for your first time as, uh, to our convocation as a trustee. I'll move on to uh, it's customary that each convocation we introduce and welcome the newest members of our community to us. And so I, you can see their names here and, and where they're working, but I do wanna go through and uh, introduce them verbally to you. First of all, uh, one of our new faculty members teaching in nursing, Tammy Davis. Welcome, Tammy. We have Eric Escalante, who's operations specialist in kinesiology and athletics. We have uh, Elena Kipinski, which is a lead gardener out at the organic farm and garden. This is a promotion. Nikki Harris to Executive Director of Human Resources. We have Patrick McGee, Technology Support Specialist two in IT. And we have another promotion, uh, uh, Neil Sparrow, Lead Gardener for the Maintenance and Operations. And then we have our uh, new Custodial Services Supervisor, Zine Sandy. So let's give a big welcome uh, to our full-time employees that have joined us today. And I always point out the fact that we couldn't do what we do here at the College of Marin with our, without our valued part-time employees, and in particular, our part-time faculty who uh, often teach in, in, in several different locations. So first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Shante Hudson in nursing, Joshua Kasoka, Osaka, Kasoka, Osaka uh, in business, Tanya Requenes in counseling, Holly Reinhardt in nursing, and Benjamin Wanzo in business as well. So a big welcome to all of our new employees. And I'll put the challenge out that I do when we're normally in person. Don't let these folks leave convocation today without a coffee date. Uh, perhaps it'll, it'll have to be a virtual coffee date or a wine date, however you wanna do that. So let's make sure that we welcome them and make sure that they feel a uh, part of our, our community. Moving on to taking a look at our agenda today. I will tell you, you can see there a number of agenda items that we have. We've got a full couple hours this morning. Uh, that first one, the national crisis, you know, I will I tell you that that's had probably nine or 10 different titles since November 6th. And I probably would have changed it this morning had I thought more about that. So anyway, we've got the national crisis, COVID-19, a little review of fall 2020 as we begin uh, uh, spring 2021. Uh, the state of the college uh, budget, highlights from last year, some descriptions of what we're going to talk about and work on this spring, the Emoja Equity Institute, and then we have our keynote, our panel presentation at the end. So with that, I'm going to change screens here, pull up some of my talking points. So, you know, it's interesting at this time of year, it's customary that I would wish you all a heartfelt Happy New Year as I welcome you to our spring convocation. Perhaps being overly optimistic, hopeful, uh, naive perhaps, I had in my mind that once we cleared 2020, things would somehow be magically better, especially given the many challenges we faced in 2021, or 2020, excuse me. I always think that I see that dumpster fire image that comes up and I would think that's pretty fitting for what we uh, endured in 2020. While I'm still very hopeful 2021 will be far better than 2020, the new year certainly got off to a very rocky start. I could have never imagined the insurrection of January 6th as our democracy in the nation's capital came under siege by rioters and insurgents. 
This coming on top of everything else we experienced in 2020. Let's face it, we encountered and endured a lot in 2020. A global pandemic taking the lives of over 2.1 million people worldwide. Economic chaos and uncertainty resulting from record unemployment rates and the closure of businesses. Extreme political divisiveness and long overdue and painful reckoning of the racial injustice and white supremacy that has plagued our systems and institutions for over 400 years. This period will most certainly be reflected in the textbook. However we chronicle our future in the, uh, our history in the future, we're being one of the most challenging periods of our time. Because there's so much uncertainty about when and how we'll get beyond these challenges, I've decided that for purposes of our engagement this morning, that it's best we focus on that which we know so that we can garner an understanding of our individual and collective roles as we leverage our resources on behalf of our students and community, and as we begin a new semester. So having a look at what's happening on a national level and with our democracy, you know, as we look at the status of our nation and our beloved democracy, here's what I believe we know today. Yesterday, we inaugurated a new president and vice president and witnessed the first inauguration of its kind in over 152 years. While there was a transition of power, the customary signs of peaceful transition were absent. But putting that aside, we must acknowledge the hope of the new beginnings and celebrate a history-making moment with the election of the first woman vice president, I know I'm hearing thunderous applause, and with the election of the first um, black and South Asian vice president as well. What I really wanna know from you today is how many of you out there are wearing your chucks and pearls today in honor of Vice President Harris. So I'm, I'm without pearls, although I grab, grab for them on occasion, I am in my chucks today. I'm wearing my chucks, I'd show you, but I'd probably fall out of my seat in doing so. So looking back at the election of 2020, uh, it was tumultuous. I think we can all agree about that. It's been a long period of time, but we turned out record numbers of voters. President Biden prevailed with six, little review here, 306 electoral votes and over, 100, over 81 million popular votes. And former President Trump received 232 electoral votes and over 74 million popular votes. However you cut that, these are extremely impressive numbers for both candidates. And while not quite the equal split of 50-50s, 51.3 and 46.8, there were clearly many people who, at least when they initially voted, wanted this all to go in a different direction than where we ended up. To me, this supports the premise that we are indeed a divided nation. And I believe we are divided on some very important issues. One of the new administration's greatest challenges will be in uniting our divided country. And I gotta say, you know, despite the fact that we live in the Bay Area, known for its liberal, liberal and progressive politics, we have all witnessed firsthand right here in Marin County that those views are not shared by all. In fact, extreme factions and the views of some are live here in, in the county as well as here at the college. I call this out as a reminder that we are, even here at home, we aren't always on the same page. Nonetheless, we need to find ways to disagree respectfully and to work toward positive approaches to problem solving. The insurrection we witnessed on January 6 disturbed many of us to our cores. For some, it was a painful reminder of the many incidents we witnessed and experienced throughout 2020. For many, it was a painful reminder of the reality they experience each day as a person of color as a, or as a person who has historically been on the margin of society. So I look around, I looked at our mission, I looked at our college-wide student learning outcomes, and I did find one that resonates in this area. We have six college-wide learning outcomes, just as a reminder, uh, these learning outcomes reflect the core competencies required of students who complete the degree program, but really is the core of what we do in our business and education. The one that jumped out at me was cultural awareness and community engagement. And it says about that, become ethically responsible, equity-minded participants in society, informed and involved in civic affairs and environmental stewardship locally, nationally, and globally. Demonstrate understanding of appreciation of diversity of cultural works, practices, and beliefs. So I gotta say to the SLO committee out there, there's a lot of packed in there, and, but in essence, it calls us to action as educators. I don't believe we have faced a more important mandate in our recent history. So given what we know, what is my call to action for you today? First and foremost, despite the very different picture of the Capitol that we witnessed yesterday, resplendent with patriotism, hope, and positivity, 
we can't simply push aside or block out what transpired just two weeks ago on January 6th. Respectful dialogue and engagement have never been more important. For those of us who have the privilege and responsibility of working directly with our students, I implore you to create spaces to discuss what they witnessed and experienced and how they are feeling. Seize the opportunity to identify readings, assignments, and projects which relate. This is a time to pull out all of your magic and to share your ideas and resources with your colleagues. And I really encourage that perhaps even this week during department meetings that this could be a topic of conversation. And for those of us who don't work directly with students, I believe we need to engage with each other, be open with our feelings and to listen and with an open heart and with the intent of fully understanding and hearing what we are hearing or hearing what we're listening to what we're hearing. All of this has to be done with a mindful eye on mental health. I bring up mental health because let's face it folks, there were many people who were struggling prior to January 6th. And what they saw that day really hit them to the core and really pushed them in a direction of much further instability. So I say that to also remind us that we do have support services available for both our students and employees. And I noted some really great session in this week's flex schedule that I hope many of you took advantage of. So let me shift my comments now to COVID-19, the pandemic. I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around the fact that it was one year ago yesterday on January 20, 2020, when the first case of coronavirus was reported in the United States. That first case was a 35-year-old man who had returned home to Sonomish County, Washington, my home state, from Wuhan, China after a three-month family visit. Shortly after that, there was the first outbreak in a long-term care facility, and so on and so on. And within a couple short months, the virus had spread into every county across our great nation infecting one in 14 people. And I don't need to remind all of you that by March 23rd, we were remote with instruction, student services, and the operations of the college. I don't think any of us could have imagined that we would still be in this situation today. And I would be remiss in not taking yet another moment to sing your praises once again. I have, have such respect for how you pivoted in the, in the beginning and how you have sustained all these months later. As of today, nationwide, we have lost over 401,000 people. We went over 400,000 people earlier this week. And there are now 23 million cases reported as I indicated one in 14 nationwide. As the virus continued to spread despite the limited availability of vaccinations, here in California now, we have our death tolls at over 34,000 and we have 3 million reported cases. And then even closer to home in the Bay Area, our death toll is at around 3,400 with over 341,000 reported cases. In Marin County, we remain in the purple tier and under a stay at home order. And it doesn't appear the order will be lifted anytime soon. The deci deciding factor when that order will, will be lifted relates to the number of available intensive care unit beds. And the established benchmark is the availability of a minimum of 15% of ICU beds. In the Bay Area right now, we're only at 7% available beds. So clearly we're only halfway to the benchmark that's been set of when we would be able to uh, lift the stay at home order. Fortunately, we now have access to vaccines for the virus, but most states and local jurisdictions have been challenged with getting it out in a timely manner. Just this morning, CNN reported that over 16 million doses of the vaccine are currently available in the US. With a little bit of good news also that Johnson & Johnson has a product that will be coming out in the near future, which would then make the, the three different vaccines available. But all of, of all those 16.5 million doses that are available, only 46% have gotten distributed or made it and made it their way into arms, so to speak. And then I heard an, another report earlier during the week saying that here in California, same thing, only about 50% of the vaccines that we have available to distribute have actually been distributed. So under the heading of what I know to be true, I'm very pleased to report that the College of Marin is in the queue for vaccination. Let me take a moment to break that down further. I know that many of us read uh, earlier this week the, the IJ with great interest about the vaccines that were recently administered to some of the K-12 teachers. In fact, uh, 1,248 Marin County teachers and others working directly with students in the county were vaccinated. But to put this in context, that's 1,248 out of approximately 10,000 employees in the K-12 system that need to be vaccinated in the county. 
And I've confirmed with uh, County Superintendent Mary Jane Burke that we have a long way to go, as which you can imagine. So I'm pleased to report that beginning last week, our nine nursing faculty and 86 nursing students began to receive the vaccine. Our next wave of eligible employees will be in the phase 1B tier one section. You can go on the county and find out how the, all the, the phases are set up and how the tiers are set up. On January 14th, I was informed by Marin County Health officials uh, that, and I quote, we will notify you of instructions when we open phase 1B, end quote. While not confirmed, we understand that phase 1B could begin as early as January or early February. Uh, and I would say we will continue to monitor the situation daily and we'll let you know as soon as we hear more. So more along the lines of what I know to be true, which is why we're meeting today the way we are, is that we will be remote through spring semester. And I know that Vice President Eldridge, very soon when I hand this off to him, we'll talk more about that in his report. So I wanted to just recap by saying, you know, I, I wanted to highlight what's going on nationally because it does impact us locally, most certainly with what's happening within our government, our democracy, and certainly the pandemic, what continues to happen nationwide, nationwide impacts us locally. So as we begin to look at this spring semester that we're starting together, uh, I thought it was important to go back and look at how we did fall semester because fall semester was the first semester that we had where we were fully from beginning to end. Summer was an exception, obviously summer is a, a, an anomaly given the size and length of the, of, of the offerings. But it was the first full semester that we went from beginning to end in this remote format. So. Uh, Vice President Alger has a great presentation about some of the lessons learned, looking back, but more importantly, taking those lessons and applying them moving forward. So with that, I will hand it off to Vice President Eldridge. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I will share my screen. And um, yes, I uh, would like to give a little bit of a review of fall of 2020. Um, some of us may rather not look back, uh, but I think it's important to understand the things we accomplished, uh, the challenges we faced, uh, and how that will impact as we move uh, us as we move forward into uh, spring and beyond. Um, and I want to start just a little bit to give you context of the massive amount of work that went into providing student support. And you know, pretty much everyone on this uh, webinar played a role in this in one form or another. Uh, but if you look at any higher ed publication, you will see that uh, the, the pandemic has really laid bare the structural inequalities um, of higher education uh, with the haves and have nots. And that uh, community college students in particular uh, have struggled. I think initially, uh, a lot of folks thought that community college enrollment would spike because uh, folks wouldn't be going off to four-year institutions. And while we've seen some enrollment shift because of that, um, a lot of our more vulnerable students um, have really struggled uh, across the country in community college to stay enrolled. Uh, and I wanna share a quote from one of our students um, and because I think this is a good representative uh, sense, uh, gives you a good representative sense of some of the things that our students are, are dealing with. Uh, but it also leads into, um, our, um, our efforts. Uh, and I will say that uh, I'm really uh, proud and pleased of the efforts of um, our student activities and advocacy staff, uh, Siddi Kasula Manhara, Nikisha Dyer, um, Matt Kent, I mean, um, all of the folks who led the effort to try to coordinate our Calm Cares um, and get things in the hands of students so they could stay enrolled. And when we see our enrollment numbers here in a minute, um, you'll see that we actually fared better than a lot of institutions, particularly with those students who um, struggled um, to have access to everything from technology um, to uh, housing and food. So our students have um, significant uh, basic needs. Uh, and we surveyed students in the fall, much as we did last spring. And thank you to Holly Schaefer uh, in PRE for um, leading that survey effort. Um, but that a majority of our students have had economic hardship. Uh, about half of them have had drop in employment or earnings. 20% um, lived in a situation um, um, that uh, was difficult in terms of um, covering the costs of housing. Um, about the same amount have had trouble paying bills. Uh, and you can see the rest of the statistics there. Um, you know, the majority of our students also in this survey said that they have um, at least sometimes experienced stress and anxiety. And this goes back to the mental health aspects that the president was talking about uh, around employment, food, their living situation, their financial situation. 
Um, and in fact, nearly 40% of the respondents to our survey um, said that they very often or often um, have feelings of stress or anxiety around issues brought on by the pandemic. And yet they're still in school. Uh, and if we ask ourselves how that's the case, um, here gives you a, a sense of uh, the magnitude of the work that, uh, that was put together. Um, since last March, we have been able to marshal over a million dollars of support for our students. You can see how that's been distributed roughly. Uh, and now that we're heading into spring semester, we're back at it, getting additional laptops in the hands of additional students um, and uh, gearing up for what will be another difficult semester for a number of our students. We also know that the second um, stimulus package um, will result in additional funds coming to us with additional direct assistance funds um, that we will be able to get into the hands of students at some point. We don't have that yet, uh, but our hope is that we will have it soon. Uh, and my big thanks to John Horneck, Dean of Enrollment Services and his staff for making sure that uh, we were able to process very quickly last spring and through the summer, um, a significant amount of assistance for our students. Um, and as you can see, um, faculty primarily and others um, submitted nearly 1,200 ComCares reports of students who were struggling in one way or another, um, and we were able to um, have uh, direct contact uh, with just about all of those students and get them uh, connected to resources, either these resources internally or in the community as well. Um, the president, as I said, mentioned mental health. Um, a big thank you to Dr. Stormy Miller and Student Accessibility Services, um, her staff, um, Danila uh, Musante, um, our mental, full-time mental health counselor, as well as um, our folks in Emoja, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Walter Turner and others who have really focused on issues of equity and mental health, recognizing that um, not only does the pandemic uh, affected certain students, predominantly our black and brown students, uh, more significantly due to structural inequalities. Uh, but these are the same students who also during the pandemic um, have been witnessing um, the, um, the glaring examples of police brutality and, and other things that um, really create an environment where education is not going to be the top uh, priority for them. And yet they've been able to persist uh, and do well at the college, uh, thanks to the efforts uh, that have been put in place. And I also wanna thank all of the faculty um, and the staff who um, participated earlier this week uh, with our presenter uh, from Side by Side talking about trauma-informed teaching. We also provide a lot of other support, support that we typically provide, but we provide it in different ways. I mean, we have an online uh, writing center, but our um, reading and writing lab is designed to be in person. And yet, um, when you combine the efforts, uh, and thanks to Beth Shosky uh, in English for providing these statistics and for helping to coordinate all of this, um, we had a big increase in use from fall of 19 when we were in person. Um, we had almost 600 students um, take advantage of, of these efforts. And we know from our survey that use of counseling, um, of library support and other things in the online environment was up significantly in the fall over the spring as well. So a uh, little bit on enrollment from the fall. Um, and this is, slide has a bunch of information. Uh, this next slide does, but um, I'll walk through it uh, with you. So if you look on the right side first, I just Googled um, community college enrollment pandemic. And as you can see, there's no good news out there. Um, there are, you know, very few, if any, examples of co community colleges across the country or in the state who've seen their enrollment go up. Um, I've talked with my colleagues um, at other California community colleges, um, and routinely they are seeing uh, decreases of enrollment between 10 and 20 percent. So if you look to the left side, uh, our fall uh, 2020 enrollment, we were down 9 percent, um, but I'm going to put that in context for you. So FTES refers to the full-time equivalent, which really talks about how many students are taking close to a full load of courses. Um, and what we can see from this is that our full-time equivalent was down much less than our headcount, which means that the students who are with us were actually taking slightly more classes on average than they typically have in the past. Now, it's not good to be down 9%, but that was actually better than the state average for the California community colleges uh, and better than the national average. Um, the other thing that we wanted to pay attention to was that uh, that number, that 9% was at census date, which is about three weeks into the term uh, when we um, stop uh, allowing for uh, additions into classes. 
But we wanted to take a look at, did we have a big drop off over the course of the term? Was the stress of all the things I was talking about um, uh, with the pandemic, um, the shift to online learning, did this cause a big drop in enrollment over the course of the term? So in other words, how many students actually completed uh, the, the term? And as you'll see, um, we only lost another couple of percentage of students. I say only, I mean, it's too much, but at the same time, that's not out of the ordinary for what we typically see. Um, so that's the good news in all of this, that the efforts that I showed you on the student support slide and the, the Herculean efforts of a lot of staff and faculty, um, we were able to keep most of our students and have them successfully complete fall semester. Now, the other part of this that's interesting and what I don't know about the other community colleges across the state and the nation is how many fewer units they were offering. Um, we were offering uh, basically almost 12% fewer sections in the fall and that's for a variety of reasons. Um, but uh, given that we were offering fewer sections um, at a greater rate than we um, were down in enrollment is encouraging. And as you look down at the lower half of the screen on the left side, for this coming spring, these are yesterday's numbers. Um, instead of being down 9% going into the semester, we're down 3.3. And this is against spring of last year, which is pre-pandemic, um, looking at, uh, um, I should have updated that instead of one and a half weeks to start of term, it's actually um, as of yesterday, as of Wednesday, the 20th. Um, we're only down 1% in FTES, um, and yet we have 9% fewer sections. Um, now, I will say that in non-credit, which is largely our ESL population, we know that this is a particularly hard hit um, demographic, um, and we are tracking down significantly from last spring. Um, and uh, I know that uh, our um, ESL faculty, both credit and non-credit, have been working very hard um, to help these students um, gain access to the technology they need and find ways to be successful uh, as they uh, try to move forward. Um, also, community education, which is an important part of what we do. Um, this last fall, we offered 100 classes fully online, and we had over 1,400 students. Um, now, this is about 50% of what we would typically offer in community education uh, and what we offered in fall of 2019. Uh, but given that um, we had basically no experience of online or hybrid uh, education within our uh, uh, community education realm, uh, this is pretty significant. The fact that um, Carol uh, Hildebrand is the director and her staff and all of the folks uh, associated with ESCOM were able to come together um, and identify 100 classes that could be offered online and get the faculty up and running and trained to do that uh, and have um, nearly 1,500 um, student uh, uh, members of the community take these classes successfully over the course of fall um, is, uh, is very good news. Um, and they plan on trying to expand that for the spring. Enrollment is uh, underway now. So what are some of the things that we learned? Um, as I mentioned, uh, if you remember, we in the spring uh, conducted a survey of faculty and of students about what was that transition like? Um, what are the difficulties? What are you facing? We updated that survey to talk about how is online learning going now in the fall? And of course, we had two groups of students take that survey. One group uh, are the ones who were with us in the spring, and then the other group um, would be new to the college. Um, and then of course we inter, uh, um, surveyed the faculty as well. And here's what the faculty had to say. Uh, we had about 101 faculty uh, respond to the survey. Uh, and in terms of how prepared faculty were feeling uh, for fall semester, um, as you can see the overwhelming uh, number of folks felt at least somewhat prepared. Um, and um, compared to the results of the student survey, um, faculty perceived that synchronous and pre-recorded uh, lectures were less effective than the students did. I think our faculty are a little harder on themselves in terms of the quality that they uh, want to be providing. Uh, but I will say that um, these numbers are dramatically improved from when we surveyed folks in the uh, spring. Um, faculty are, you know, express some concern about uh, how engaged students are, which obviously um, is a, um, given everything that everyone is facing, is a big concern that we all face uh, and all are worried about. Um, but I think that when we see the student results, we'll see that students actually felt as though faculty did a great job of engaging them and felt that they were engaged and were happy with their, um, uh, with their instruction. 
So as you can see, um, even our faculty were saying that they felt the, the big majority of our students were at least somewhat engaged uh, in the learning process in the online uh, environment. And I'll make these slides available. Uh, I've made the uh, survey results available to the faculty, but we'll make them available more broadly so that you can look at the numbers uh, in more detail uh, as we go. Uh, and then finally, we asked faculty, uh, what else do you need? And this is what's been driving some of our efforts, um, both with Flex Week now, uh, as well as looking ahead into the spring as to how we can do ongoing professional development and support for faculty. And of course, the, in, instead of just saying, I got to figure out Zoom, I think we're now at the point where faculty are looking at how they can do, uh, how you can do some more um, in-depth uh, technological um, uh, 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 uses for um, to support your pedagogy. So VoiceThread, Proctorio, um, uh, effective uh, editing techniques for video recordings, things that I think last spring were not even on our radar because we were simply trying to make do. Uh, and now we're at the point where we're really looking at how do we uh, use these things and perhaps use these things moving forward beyond the pandemic. Um, also, um, faculty still looking for ways to engage students, um, looking at ways to more effectively facilitate interactions and participation. And then obviously we also saw some requests um, just that this is a lot, uh, which is understandable. And we did work with uh, UPM and thankful for their uh, um, assistance in um, looking to make available for some of our faculty the opportunity for reduced load and other things. But switching to the student uh, survey, and we had over a thousand students uh, respond, which was good, we hoped for that amount. Um, that of the um, respondents returning from spring, 62% uh, said their fall uh, course experience is much improved or somewhat improved, which is good to know. That's what we wanted to see. That's why we created the online um, additional uh, workshops for faculty over the summer, trying to make sure that we had um, uh, improved use of uh, Canvas and, and comfort level in the online environment. Another piece of good news from our student survey is that 78% of courses were rated excellent or good, and 90% of respondents uh, rated at least one course positively. Um, and I think given the environment we're in, uh, again, we can feel good about that. Uh, there's always room for improvement, um, and we will be working to improve, obviously. I, I think everyone's been, been thinking uh, about how to do that. Um, but given the situation we're in, um, we were, uh, I think, pleasantly surprised that um, students felt this good about their experience. Um, and students were most likely to rate as very effective in structure, uh, instructor recorded lectures um, and live stream classes, uh, virtual office hours. I think for a lot of our students who are juggling many things, including siblings who are also needing to be uh, on Zoom at different times and there's um, sharing equipment and trying to help make sure that they're at work, um, that the more we can do um, to record synchronous lectures, the more we can do to provide asynchronous contact, content, that will allow our students um, the flexibility that they need um, to be more successful. Um, but also nearly 90% of students um, strongly or somewhat agreed that their courses are well organized in Canvas, that there are clear expectations. Um, and this is a big improvement from spring when again, we over one week of spring break um, flipped the switch and suddenly went to a very different way of, of approaching things. Um, and, you know, it, when nearly 85% um, feel satisfied with what they're learning in their classes, we of course would like that to be 100%, but even in the best of times, um, this number is not out of the realm of uh, where we often see that uh, in other surveys. And then um, finally, um, Again, as I mentioned before, students used a lot of resources at higher rates in fall 2020 um, than in the spring 2020 survey. Um, they were now more used to using academic counseling online and thanks to all of our counselors for being available for those remote appointments. Library services and our librarians and our staff there have done a phenomenal job of making sure students have access to materials in the virtual environment. As I mentioned, the online writing center and the virtual reading and writing lab uh, and the online math lab as well. So. Um, what do we really garner from all of this? I think really what we know is that people are the key, the faculty, staff, and students, and our community partnerships. Uh, and we have a, a number of community partners from 10,000 Degrees to Side by Side to Center for Domestic Peace and others um, who've really helped us. But the, the, our people are the key, um, have been working inordinately hard to make this work. But also, I think we know that our people remain under significant stress. Uh, and the last thing any of us want is another semester um, of turmoil, 
On the other hand, um, I think we're, we're about to the point where we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We also learned we can accomplish a lot remotely uh, and that to some extent we can leverage what we're learning and, and the practice uh, with it uh, post pandemic. Um, some of that will be in uh, leveraging um, uh, asynchronous content, um, looking at hybrid approaches to instruction post pandemic, but also the provision of services and the way in which um, some staff can very effectively uh, complete their, um, uh, their job duties remotely. But we also know there's no substitute for human connection. Uh, and as much as um, I love seeing um, folks on Zoom, I would much more uh, uh, appreciate seeing everyone face to face and being able to have that human connection. I know that's something that we all continue to struggle with. Um, we also know that as the president said, spring brings more of the same. Uh, and as we look ahead, um, you know, we will probably largely be online for the summer, but our, we'll be talking in the COVID Oversight Committee about how to get back into the classroom and onto our campuses um, for fall. And it probably won't look exactly the way it did before the pandemic, um, but certainly that's what we all hope to have happen and what we'll be working toward. Um, we are planning for that flexible fall of 2021. Um, I think we have some creative ways to, to um, give ourselves flexibility um, in the schedule, uh, which is important because we are at remain at the mercy of the county and the state and uh, national government when it comes to um, how quickly we'll be able to um, get vaccines and um, have other resources in place uh, to be back in person. And then just finally, while all of that was going on, we had a lot of non-pandemic business that got taken care of. Um, program review is underway and thanks to everyone in the fine arts and other areas that were doing that and to um, our faculty who've been um, assisting with that. We had some successful searches, as you saw earlier. Um, community hour continued. Um, the midterm accreditation report is wrapping up and a huge thanks to Kerry Torres and, and uh, Holly Schaefer and a number of other people who've been working very hard on that. Um, we're in the process of, of the design of the LRC project. Uh, participatory governance went on. I know that most participatory, participatory governance committees took a lo long, hard look at their um, charges um, and started asking how can we make sure that we're being anti-racist in the work that we do to really review the way we approach our policies and procedures at the college. So that's fall semester. Uh, it was a lot. Um, thank you to everybody for the incredible hard work that was put into that. Uh, I know that we're gonna have a successful spring building off of that. Um, and also as we gear up for um, what hopefully will be, if not a return to where we were, um, a, uh, a more normalcy uh, as we head into the next academic year. Jonathan, thank you very much. Excellent report. And I really want to thank you for your leadership this last year. And I think you actually just recently celebrated your eighth anniversary or so at the college. So congratulations on that as well. Thank you very much. Now, it's been a while since we've had a financial update. And as you can imagine, there's been a lot going on in the economy, as I referred to earlier, but there's been a lot going on related to COVID and the expenses related to that and, and all kinds of different things as it relates. And now with the new budget coming out from the governor here recently, I think it's really timely that we have an overview and outlook of an update on our budget situation. So with that, I invite uh, Vice President Greg Nelson to take it away. All right, thank you, Dr. Kuhn. Uh, some of the, what I'm gonna share with you today is not so much a repeat, but I'm spotlighting some of the things that um, Vice President Eldridge also mentioned uh, to, to a degree. So welcome back to spring 21. I'm good, uh, happy to virtually see everybody. And like John said, uh, be glad to see everybody in person at some point um, due to the nature of how we do business. It certainly made some things a little different this year. So I just wanted to show you some headlines in the news, uh, kind of similar uh, thing topic that we're going on. Uh, high schools, graduates fall nationally because of the pandemic for college enrollment. Fewer students attending based on fall numbers. This is from fall semester. You got high school grad students that are not uh, coming to community colleges uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we hit a 20 year low in community college enrollment overall. And students are grappling, as many of you know, 
with uh, job losses, online learning, and a host of other things that affect their um, abilities to get an education to further themselves. Well, there's what Dr. Coombe was talking about, how 2020 is a dumpster fire. So some of the general challenges, obviously, in 2020, I don't need to remind everybody, is uh, we had a lot of unknown economic impacts. Did Back in the spring, when we first went on um, our stay-at-home order, we didn't know what the economy would do to us. Uh, a lot was unknown at that time. We had wildfires. Speaking, you know, since I live in Sonoma County, uh, we've had our share. Of course, the pandemic, we've had technology gaps with the students not having access to Wi-Fi, not having access to computers, uh, et cetera. Uh, food bank needs, people not being able to get food they need to just sustain themselves for them or and or their uh, loved ones, ch children especially. Equal access is a huge issue. We're starting to see that plus, you know, widening racial disparities and what the pandemic has done to community colleges as far as who has equal access to the resources available to us. And then, like I said, stress from impact to families, uh, school and jobs, and then ultimately job losses. Uh, the job loss category and the unemployment rate has been pretty significant for a lot of people. And I personally know, and I'm sure a lot of you personally know, people who work for hourly rates, waiters, waitresses, tradespeople, et cetera, that were laid off or furloughed, and some still are um, laid off to this day. So the state of the existing budget, you know, as a, if you can read my Dilbert cartoon, uh, how much confidence do you have in your cost projections? And this, are these assumptions realistic? Well, I will tell you that uh, we held positions that were vacant, vacant or vacated, and they were not needed right away. And uh, others that took advantage of the resignation incentives as a preemptive strike so that we would save those funds due to the pandemic and economic uncertainty that I mentioned. Uh, many of you know we had a reduced offering for summer term. Uh, we offered fewer sections in fall and spring terms compared to previous uh, years, um, which has also uh, saved the college a little bit of some money. We're still awaiting the theme of reimbursement from Cal OES because the pandemic was declared a national disaster. And so we've been trying to collect fees, et cetera, uh, so we can get reimbursed from FEMA for our essential workers. <clears throat> and from, let me just stop right there for a second and say, while a lot of us have been in stay at home order and so forth, we've had a lot of operational staff from maintenance and operations to custodial and police my hat's off to them. Uh, many of them have worked every day to make sure that the, the campus main, maintains a level of cleanliness that we need during the pandemic, and especially now for some of those few courses that have to be on campus and or uh, faculty and staff that are on campus occasionally. We've got negotiated settlements in place with CSEA and SEIU. UPM's current and current negotiations now. And then the biggest thing was the property taxes have not taken a dip as they initially perceived. While we haven't received word yet for next year for property taxes from the county, we anticipate to hear that news here in the next few weeks. The state of the existing budget, and this is one of my favorite pictures. This, for y'all that don't know, this happens in Georgia all the time. Um, please love to hide to catch you doing something. Currently, we're going to meet our minimum reserve of 10%, which is board policy, and we have an administrative procedure to support it. We're going to begin looking at the currently funded vacancy list. Um, that's positions that are vacant but funded for the 2021-2022 uh, fiscal year so that we can start making some decisions uh, so that human resources has the appropriate amount of time to do the 
recruitments accordingly to their procedures. We're still optimistic that our current assumptions will hold that we have projected in our budget documents with the help of PRAC and uh, participatory governance process. And then we're confident we'll be set for the rest of this year, uh, going to, for the next five months, basically. So with that, I wanna talk about uh, the highlights from the governor's budget. Some ongoing funding highlights that have showed up in his budget and um, you don't need to write all these down per se. I'll, in our, my next newsletter, I'll either that or in an email, I'll send the hyperlink to the analysis from the legislative analyst office regarding the uh, ongoing uh, highlights for the, from the governor's budget request. He's looking at one-time funds for retention and re-enrollment strategies. Uh, this is to help uh, maintain and re-enroll students who are full-time. He's adding resources uh, for mental health care for students, expanding the online education ecosystem and infrastructure. That's a broad term. We don't know exactly what that means. If that's allocations to the institutions themselves, or if he's looking at doing something at the statewide level. There's a 1.5% COLA for categorical programs, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. He's added money to increase the broadband for Cynic. Cynic is the uh, broadband company that the college uses um, for our uh, fiber and internet connection between campuses and so forth. We don't buy our, our um, internet connections from someone like AT&T or Verizon someone that you would use at home. Cynic is our state sponsored program. And then one of the big ones, he's, he's gonna buy down the pension cost by 2% per year for, for STRS. This past year, he did that at the state wide level. Going forward, he will be doing, he is recommending that money be passed off to the co individual colleges, to the individual college districts uh, to help with that cost. Some one-time one-time excuse me one-time funding highlights uh, emergency assistance grants for students. So this the first bullet is um, what he calls an early action program. He plans to allocate those funds in the spring of this year by March or April here next couple of months to get that going. Uh, looking to address basic needs related to food and housing insecurity. Uh, as I mentioned, retention and re-enrollment. Plans to expand work-based learning and expand the zero uh, textbook cost program uh, uh, statewide. And he's talking about providing in instructional materials for dual enrollment students, which would certainly help uh, due to the price of textbooks and so on. And AB 1460 implementation and anti-racism initiatives uh, he has put some dollars toward it, toward that too. One of the reasons I haven't put the dollar values of what the governor has asked for is as many of you know, these are all speculative at this time and require, are required to go through the assembly and more than likely many of them from a dollar standpoint will change over the next uh, six months. I wanna share with you some uh, major policy changes that are coming forward. Uh, here's emergency financial, uh, financial aid assistance. Um, this is part of that early action program, $100 million. It would target full-time students who are previously working full-time or the equivalent of full-time again, to demonstrate the need. And for the remaining 150 million students also have to maintain the 2.0 GPA other last three semesters. From a financial aid standpoint, this is uh, different than what we've done in the past. You'll read that first sentence. The budget includes a proposal that all high school seniors uh, are required to take the FAFSA or complete the FAFSA 
Uh, they're trying to get the Cal Grant Awards uh, up by 9,000. I'm not sure where that number comes from right at this point, but he's trying to see who is eligible for aid uh, in regards to the FAFSA that they may or may not know that they have extra aid available to them for higher education. In regards to that COLA that I mentioned earlier for categorical programs, uh, the state's gonna require an, um, an action, actionable plan to close the equity gap uh, to be submitted to the state. You know, and that will be part of the process in order for us to receive the COLA for the categorical programs uh, going forward. Of course, there's changes for online courses. Uh, I don't think we'll have this problem because we've had, we had very few online courses before compared to what we have now, but it's requiring a 10% improvement on, high, on online courses from what was offered in 1819. And then of course, additional details will be provided later in trailer bills to see what that actually means. So I'll conclude with this, you know, trying to make projections on the budget and what the policies change, changes do to us, um, those type of things, kind of like where we were last spring. Uh, try, trying to make predict, projections is like <laughs> forecasting the weather some days. And sometimes you nail it and sometimes it rains on a sunny day. So with that, I, ho I hope we have a great semester. We're gonna finish the semester strong and in a better position than most of our counterpart sister schools are in the Bay Area. Dr. Kuhn. Thank you, Vice President Nelson. Appreciate it. Uh, great report. And uh, thank you also for your leadership and your team and everything they've been doing this past year to keep us afloat. We're running a little bit behind on time. It's a little different in this format. The, the, the VPs know my sign when I get a little antsy when we're in person or I stand up. And they, know, they know to kind of move it along, cut it short, but run a little long, but I think we can go to the next one. No, before we go to the next slide, I think both VPs covered enough here in this area that I just want to share one additional uh, highlight. Uh, this is kind of hot off the press. So if you'll indulge me for a moment, then we'll move to the next aspect of the program. So uh, College of Rent has been awarded the Department of Education Open Textbooks Pilot Program Grant to create new open educational materials in disciplines where little exists. $2 million grant was awarded to a consortium made up of COM, College of the Canyons, West Hills Lamore, and Allen Hancock. COM will receive approximately $430,000 to do equity work around uh, surrounding textbook justice. Uh, the work COM will undertake will involve an additional aspect surrounding the requirements for the new content creation. All new materials must include a predetermined minimum curriculum Minimum curricular focus on addressing structural racism inherent in higher education and individual disciplines. Here's where it gets down to brass tacks. We will be awarding seven faculty slash student pairs uh, to work together on this project in, in, in identified high need areas. The project to create an open educational primer on instructional racism across disciplines is currently underway and all at COM are invited to participate. Please reach out to Dr. Susan Rahman Professor of Sociology and Psychology, who we have to acknowledge today for helping make this grant possible. So Susan, as always, you're a rock star. Thank you very much. So that was the one highlight I wanted to uh, share with you beyond what uh, the VPs have talked about. So with that, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is where I have the introduction uh, the opportunity to introduce the Emoja Equity Institute. This week, we celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Despite yesterday's historic inauguration, which focused on hope and healing, the insurrection of January 6 hasn't been far from our minds, just as the reckoning of racial justice hasn't been far from our minds. Last year, we turned our focus to dismantling white supremacy and racial injustice through a variety of important initiatives. Last summer, our Emoja program faculty and staff presented a proposal to, to develop an Emoja Equity Institute. I know that many of you had the opportunity to hear about the proposal throughout fall semester. Today, I am pleased to announce the launch of the Emoja Equity Institute, UEI is what we're referring to it as. And I'm gonna read just briefly from the proposal. 
The Amoja Equity Institute will establish COM as a research and training hub for the development of innovative anti-racist programs and services. The UEI seeks to complement the mission, strategic plan, and equity plan of the College of Marin, the President's nine-point plan, and the Chancellor's Office call to action to community colleges. Uh, today's panel presentation is the first of many UEI programs to come. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the faculty, staff, and administrators who are involved in the UEI. And at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Walter Turner, our Moja coordinator, to introduce our panel. Walter, good morning. Thank you, and uh, glad to uh, be here. It's certainly my, uh, uh, my pleasure. And they're asking me to start here my video, which I've started my uh, video. Um, I want to thank you. Such good news there, uh, uh, Dr. Kuhn, regarding the uh, funds for curricula. Uh, that's certainly one of the key pillars of what we'll be doing with the Emoja uh, Equity Institute. And excuse me, I had a different screen backing on because I was doing something the other day, but I'll, I'll leave it up. I'm at my vacation home, so we'll will work from that. I wanna thank, first of all, uh, President Superintendent, Dr. David Wayne Kuhn, Vice President John Eldridge and uh, Dean Greg Nelson uh, for their support of the Emoja Equity Institute. I want to also thank um, the Board of Trustees of College of Marin for being in attendance. I know we'll have a session with them coming up in a week or so. Uh, my name is Professor Walter Turner. I'm the Chairperson of the Social Sciences uh, department. I'm the coordinator of the College of Marin and Moja program. Uh, today we'll be hearing from Trap to Vote in this main session, and then there'll be some breakout sessions after this. We'll go from 11 to 12, and then there's going to be a Friday session actually where we'll have some uh, reflections on the work ahead regarding equity and inclusion uh, at the College of Marin. I especially want to take a moment here uh, to extend a big round of thanks to all of the faculty and staff at the College of Marin. Somewhere in September or October, our team working on the Emoja Equity Institute uh, went through and began a series of what we refer to as engagement meetings. And I have to say that uh, they're very enlightening. Uh, they're very exciting. Uh, we did a lot of learning. We did a lot of listening. and. I'm convinced that the College of Marin is, I'm more positive that the College of Marin is on the road to building institutional equity at the College of Marin. We undertook approximately 25, what we refer to as engagement meetings. And I wanna thank all of the faculty and all of the governance and all the committee members who participated in those particular conversations. I wanna give you a credit here online uh, we met with the learning committees, with MAPS, with Puente, with ASCOM, uh, with the Academic Senate, with the uh, Classified Senate, with the department chairs, with psychological services, with counseling, with the IDEA Committee, with the GRIT Committee, with professional learning, with the Transfer Center, with the Internship and Careers, with CSEA, with UPM, with EOPS, with the athletic department, with Summer Bridge, with Compass, with Outreach, with the Marin City community leaders, with Trap to Vote, who you'll hear from in just a few moments, with the Educational Planning Committee, with the Administrative Cabinet, with Distance Education, with Deans, with PRAC, with the SEIU. And I think that totals about 30 different meetings that our team has conducted since September and early October. And I think we have one or two more uh, left to complete. So to share with you, and I'm running a timer here so I don't take up too much time, uh, to share with you what the purpose of the engagement meetings has been, uh, has been the following. First of all, to hear from our colleagues about the ongoing equity work which has been going on here at College of Marin. And there has been some fantastic work. The UEI is dedicated to making College of Marin institutional to bring all of this work into an institutional framework. So we've heard from uh, the, the work that's being done by people such as MAPS and Puente and the Academic Senate and EOPS, Professional Learning Committee and UPM and USC. 
so much great work is being done. So we wanted to hear that. We wanted to be able to listen to that work. Second of all, coming out of these engagement meetings, um, having discussions about the best way to build institutional equity. And when we say institutional equity at community college, we're talking not only about the staff, we're also talking about the students, and we're also talking about our communities. Third of all, we wanted to make sure that we were in line with the chancellor's call to action, which came in June of 2020, the strategic master plan, and most importantly, um, President uh, Dr. David Waynes Kuhn, his nine point plan, uh, which he issued somewhere in, I believe it was probably of uh, August of uh, last year, August of 2020. And, and looking at that per, uh, particular plan and quoting President Kuhn, higher education, quoting, is a system rooted in racism and white supremacy. It is important to practice transparency by naming this and acknowledging College of Marin's areas of growth and how we are transforming this system. If you have not seen President Kuhn's nine point statements on um, his call after the chancellor's call, you should take a look at it. It's quite revealing and it's one thing that we want the Emoji Equity Institute to be on track with. Finally, in this proposal, we wanted to make sure that we centered our work around issues of accessibility, of anti-racism, of inclusion, of giving us the opportunity to dream and build and take advantage of this moment in history. And you've heard that from all of our speakers this morning. You'll continue to hear that from Trap to Vote. Uh, there's a scene in a film from the civil rights movement in 1963 and 1964. And uh, one of the participants in the strikes in Selma and other places comes online and they says, you know, you can't dream about things that you can't even imagine. And what we're saying is we want to use our imagination and change the way our institution uh, looks. Martin Luther King in 1967 uh, made a speech that uh, for all the praise that we give to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, he made a speech that uh, didn't make him the most popular person in the world. And that was his speech that he gave at the Riverside Church in 1967. Uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to listen to it, uh, take a listen to it. Uh, why I oppose the war in Vietnam is giving at the Riverside Church. Quoting the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and this is most appropriate at this moment. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. We, we're at a listening moment here, uh, uh, my colleagues. Many of you know I've, I've taught here, I've been on campus in many activities. We are not going to address uh, decades of systemic racism, of othering, of exclusion, of the way in which people who are immigrants have been treated, of the way in which LBGT communities have been attacked. We're not going to address that with one committee. We're not gonna address that with one change in the governance system. We're only going to be able to address this and be successful if our institution is on board about making these changes. This is not just a task for the Emoja Equity Institute. This is a task for all of College of Marin. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be uh, so honored uh, that uh, President Kuhn uh, has announced the official launching of the Emoja Equity Institute. It gives me great pleasure. Our panel today is composed of a number of people uh, who've been very, very active uh, in Marin County over the last year, and many of them going back uh, much before that. Um, they refer to themselves as trapped to vote. Uh, they were very active in the voting campaigns over the last several months before the November elections. But even prior to that, they were engaged in the Bay Area community, all the way from Sacramento, all the way down to the areas of, of Santa Cruz. I wanna announce first, uh, uh, Mr. Barry Achias. 
He is a consultant on issues related to social justice, equity, and education. Uh, he is a founding member of several organizations, Voice of the Youth, uh, Black Blueprints, Hidden Gems, et cetera. He works from Sacramento. He was formerly a student at College of Marin, so we welcome Barry back to College of Marin. I want to introduce uh, Ms. Amber Allen Pearson. Uh, she's an empath, she's a mother, she's a poet. Uh, she is a proud graduate of College of Marin. Uh, she was formerly the current, uh, the wellness outreach specialist at TAM High. She's currently working in issues of health. Welcome to College of Marin today, Amber. I want to introduce Paul Austin. He's the founder and CEO of Play Marin, uh, which serves approximately 300 young people all across uh, Marin County. He is a uh, graduate, I believe, of Dominican University. Uh, he's the one person we have here who I don't think he attended College of Marin, uh, but he did you attend College of Marin? Okay, he did attend College of Marin. So we got five for five uh, here. I know his family has been active here at College of Marin. Bishlam Bullock, who is along with his wife, Amy, is the owners of Salon B in downtown San Rafael for over 10 years. He is from one of the original families that came to Marin City in the early 1940s. And in contrast to the story about the great migration, uh, which is talked about a lot, people who came to Marin City and Vallejo and Oakland and came from Louisiana and Mississippi and Texas, they didn't come just because they decided to migrate for jobs. They came because they were escaping the horrors and terrors of the South. And those are things that as we can see over the last few years, last few decades continue to be uh, prominent in our American culture. And finally, Alina Maunder, uh, who is the newly elected governing board member of the Saucelio Marin City School District. She is a lifelong uh, resident of Marin City, her family, the early people in Marin City. Uh, she is currently the uh, lead nurse at the Zuckenberg San Francisco General Hospital. She is the nurse manager, and she also has a program in Marin City, an after school program, uh, which helps with tutoring and assistance. And by way of full disclosure, uh, I have known uh, Bisham for a while. I've known Amber for a while. I've known Paul for a while. I've known Alina for a while. And I knew Barry. Barry was also in my classes when he was in attendance at a uh, college of Marin. So for the next uh, 40 minutes to 45 minutes, uh, we're going to have some question and dialogue. Um, you will have an opportunity to talk with each of them in some of the breakout sessions. Uh, they're coming up between 11 and 12. Um, and you'll be able to talk with them directly. And there's three breakout sessions. I believe uh, Beth or one of our other uh, staff people will come on, faculty people will come on and tell you how to link to those particular uh, discussions. So thank you for being here today. Uh, we're very, very honored that you could make the time and that you could be one stage of continuing uh, what our president, what our campus and uh, others have been looking at. Let, let's start off and let's talk a bit and you can unmute yourselves. Uh, let's start off here and give us some background of what Trap the Vote is, what Trap the Vote has been and how it's uh, grown. I think we're turning to Barry and, and Paul. So go right ahead. You have the floor. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. How y'all doing? Okay, thank you. Um, it's Barry Axius. Um, I'm one of the uh, founders of the Trap the Vote Sacramento, which we started in uh, 2018. Our primary goal was to increase the number of voters amongst black youth and young adults um, to kind of break away from the um, stigma uh, that vote black folks have in voting. Um, the way we kind of collaborated, um, me and Paul first, as well as in connecting with Amber and Bishlam, um, 2008, I kind of saw, um, I believe during the midterms that um, there was a real need for us to kind of um, cultivate the ideas and the voices of young um, black uh, people in our communities. I really saw uh, a, a change and a turn in 2014 when I really understood how powerful local voting was. So Trap the Vote really came from this idea of local voting, state voting. Um, me and Paul, just at that particular time, we're just um, swapping ideas and t-shirts as I kind of galvanized certain things um, in Sacramento. Then um, talked to Paul 
as we kind of looked at a deeper lens on what this could actually be, um, looking at the Trumpism that came about um, in 2016, we looked at 2020 really launching it to the next level where then Amber and um, Bishlam came together because we saw the power in our vote. We saw that um, our vote at, at, at many times was suppressed and how do we stop oppression of our vote is by galvanizing, making it hip, giving it a great experience and, and gravitating our young people to showing how their vote um, can be powerful. And I think we lined that up by the protest in the summer of 2020, as I like to call it the righteous uprising. We utilized that moment and showed how can we produce power from protest? How can we utilize sustainable, equitable things that create change? And that's how we really um, elevated our Trap the Vote um, 2020. It was a great experience. We went from education with panels like this due to um, social distancing and COVID-19, as well as being able to still have two powerful block parties where we not only um, created um, voting uh, aptitudes, but also we leveled up the playing field by creating um, black markets for businesses to cultivate entrepreneurship. So it was a power of building and power of voting. So outside of Trap the Vote, we created Vote and Build, where not only are we going to vote, that's one part of the phrase, but we're also going to be building at the same particular time. Okay. I want to let you know uh, that we, I clearly, I should thank uh, Professor Crawford for editing down there uh, bios. Had I read each of their full bios, we would have run out of time. Uh, mm -hmm. So you really have a dynamic group in, in front of you. We want to keep it moving and we'll bounce around a little bit with the, uh, with the questions, but we wanted to make sure that you could leave this session with thoughts for the upcoming breakout session. Speak on your experiences organizing throughout Marin County over the last uh, eight to 10 months on the issues of equity and anti-racism and, and voting you've highlighted to some degree. Meaning that I think you, there was a lot of work that you didn't timber on and that was very well publicized. You were visible in Nevada, you were visible in Sacramento. So talk a bit about that work, what those experiences were like uh, raising the issues of equity and anti-racism. Sure. Good morning. Before I get started, I just want to say how glad I am to be here, particularly with some of my favorite professors um, that are in the building, Jessica Park. I don't know if Dr. Tipton is still here or Paul Cheney, Pat Sirianni, and of course, Bonnie Bornstein and Walter Turner. Thank you for having us. I'm so excited. Um, in terms of the last 10 months, as Barry said, the way we came together gave us power. We are aligned and have very similar values, which allowed us to do the emotional labor with each other that it takes to walk into a space that can sometimes feel hostile just because you're so othered as people of color. The homogeny of Marin makes it hard sometimes to go into Tiburon or Nevada and speak these pains that we're experiencing from watching what's happening over the, the country. Um, but we, I was especially um, pleasantly surprised in some of those spaces about the support that came from the community, Tiburon particularly, we were able to not only organize in a way that supported a local black business that had been harassed and create a cash mob, but we also were able to get rid of two um, officers in the Tiburon um, police department that had no business being there, their behavior and their uh, their show of racism towards black people in the community. Um, Novato, we were able to support some young people who had been harmed by a group of white Trump supporters who had actually been violent with them and made threats towards them. So some of the play, uh, Marin City on June 2nd, which is actually where we start, first started working together, we had over 1500 people come to um, protest and also grieve over the murder of George Floyd. But some places we had a bit more resistant resistance, like here in Mill Valley, where I live and where I'm a part of the DEI task force, we have been challenged with the mayor who has shown a lot of racism. And though there were people who came out and supported, we also found uh, people who showed up uh, hostile 
And we also have found a lot of resistance to some of the things that we've suggested and asked for in terms of creating equity. So it's a mixed bag in terms of the response. Like I said, there's a place where I'm pleasantly surprised by the people that have shown up, but there has also been a huge resistance, which makes sense because why would, why we have to, why do white people want to change what is? Why would they want to? It's comfortable. Marin is very, um, is a bubble. There's not, we're not seeing a lot of police shootings here and some of the things that we're seeing in some of the more extreme places. It makes it really easy to ignore or to deny or to act as if this is a place where racism or diversity training doesn't exist. But it's because of the lack of diversity that this is a place that needs it the most. What are some of these, these challenges? I, I know when I, I got a text from you, Amber, saying that, in fact, that there is a diversity equity committee. I think Novato had one a while back, uh, but there's one in Fairfax. Uh, Marin County has one at this point. Mill Valley, you've given us some discussion on that. Tip Ron is considering one. San Rafael is considering them. But at the same time, I saw the article in the Pacific Sun the other day that said, despite this activity that some things haven't changed at all. What, how do movements of social change and consciousness, how do you avoid these uh, pitfalls? What are the, the challenges of building alliances in these communities beyond what you've talked about very specifically? Um, go ahead, Paul. Real quick. <clears throat> um, I mean, well, some of the challenges is that sometimes the message might get mixed up. It might go into a whole different direction. Right, we got to make sure that we keep um, keep our message really plain and clear, which is to support the Black community and to support Black people, especially here in Marin. Like we cannot get away from that message because if we do, then it just starts to avoid and just creates um, just a whole different uh, facade, let's say, of what the true message is, which is right now the support of Black people and the Black agenda. So we got to make sure that we stay on point and make sure that everybody supports the black agenda now. Because sometimes that just, you know, people will try and divert you from what the true, um, what our true plan is. Like it, it is to support black people 100% to make sure that we get policy change, to make sure that systems are changed. And we just can't turn a blind eye to that. We cannot no longer like, we gotta hold people accountable for some of the choices that's being made um, that's keeping black communities in the same position that they are in. You know, we need to have economic change, but a lot of that um, starts, it, it all pretty much starts within the systems, the different systems, the education system, the police system, right here in Moran is uh, dealing with the, uh, the board of supervisors and a lot of the decisions that they make on behalf of the black and brown communities um, that would negatively impact, um, impact them. So, you know, for me, it's everybody standing collectively together to make sure that we don't get away from the Black agenda because the Black agenda has never had its place um, in America. And so now, to, today, now is an opportunity for us to continue to push that forward. Mm -hmm. before, yeah. I go to the, before I go to the next question, and I'll come right back to you, uh, Bishlam. Paul, give us just a, a, a short sketch here of what... Uh, uh, play Moran is because I, I see you it's so busy and so it seems to be so effective does it include all of Marin County how does it work give us a few sentences here well so so play Moran is all about creating more diversity through play and activity and one of the main things that I look at is closing the activity gap my focus is Marin City to make sure that the youth in Marin City have what they need so currently when we look at so previously when you look at the activity gap so after school um, I worked in like public schools and I worked in private schools and I saw how the influent families here in Moran had a wonderful schedule for their kids after school. They had tutoring, they had band, they had sports, they had chess club. But when we look right here in Moran City, they did not have those same opportunities. A lot of times you had to leave Moran City in order to participate in uh, extracurricular activities. But no, we bring that right here home in order for kids to make sure that they have what they need. So with Play Moran, we do everything. So we do the basic sports, basketball, um, track and field, girls volleyball, which was never done previously, starting a lacrosse program, 
but do a lot of outdoor activities too, getting kids out surfing and kayaking, mountain biking, um, to be able to open up, you know, what's their possibilities. Um, but part of it is, is trying to hold people accountable. Why Moran City don't have a, a ball field that's playable? The ball field has been ran down for over 15 years or so, and kids can't even play on it. We only have two opportunities for recreational um, activities here. We have a gym that's over 70 years old. Everywhere else in Marin, they have new facilities. I don't understand why Marin City don't. And then we have a park, Rocky Ground Park. We love it to death. But at the same time, we just don't have the same opportunities, nor do we have the same facilities as the rest of Marin. We don't have a grocery store, which is a whole nother topic. So you look at the health disparity, but Marin County can do something about it, right? Like in everywhere else, West Marin, they have a beautiful gym. I'm glad that they do. But we're such a tight pocket here in Marin City that things need to be developed to be on par with the rest of the kids in Mill Valley or Tipperon. Um, okay. okay. Bishop, you wanted to follow up on that previous uh, question, which I was asking there about some of the uh, challenges, and I'll get another question out there. But you wanted to follow up. You wanted to say something. Yeah, I just want to throw quickly in there what I'm discovering for myself, just because I'm kind of a me and my wife and the team here, uh, we're used to uh, taking an issue, grabbing it and running with it quickly without a lot of red tape. And what I find in Marin County in particular is one of the main obstacles is that we have these new DEI task force and all this, but a lot of it is just a lot of rhetorical red tape, people t talking amongst one another in these meetings and, and patting themselves on the back. Um, uh, what I find is that it, that is a hindrance to getting things done. Paul has organiza organization that's ready to go. Uh, Barry has organizations that are ready to go. Amber has programs and things in her mind that are ready to go. And we need direct funding and we need people to step out of the way and let people get to work and finish up what they need to get, you know, get done. We, we know how to run these things. Um, and we feel like, I feel like some of the DEI stuff is a lot of red tape and a lot of wasted time. So that's my, I think that's one of the main obstacles. And I want people to get really clear that we have things ready to go. Most of these community, most of our communities do. We, we need funding and we need direct action uh, uh, with the overall Marin County community, as well as College of Marin to kind of get that stuff going uh, directly to the people so we can get working. Okay, Bishlam, thank you so much. I do want to thank you, Bishlam. When I grew up in Marin City, your, uh, your, uh, your grandfather, uh, he was a minister, he was a prominent minister, and I always appreciated the fact that when he stopped me, he never talked to me about the church or about religion. He right. always was inquiring how I was doing, so he always sticks in my mind as somebody who was really one of the pillars of our, our community. Let, let me get a question out here in terms of, and maybe we can get a little bit of a round table going here. I want to get to uh, Alina Mader, who was uh, a student here at College of Marin, and her counselor, in fact, was uh, Professor uh, Renetta Early. Uh, and I remember when Alina was here. Two questions out here. Uh, how do you define equity? How do we move from the words that have become common, multiculturalism and diversity, to agency and inclusion, meaning from the words to action in some way, shape, or form. Agency means giving power. Inclusion means being part of the process. Um, and how do we, uh, and you're, you were College of Marin students, all of you, um, you know, re reflect on uh, the role of an institution like the College of Marin. And another one while I have you on here, uh, uh, Alina, you work directly in education. So why don't you go to that one first and then we'll come back to the one about defining equity and about uh, moving from to agency and inclusion. But talk to us about your perspective on education, see where we can link that, Alina. Sure. Um, so I have uh, two school age children, a fifth grader and a first grader. Um, and uh, being a lifelong resident of Marin City, you know, I grew up. Um, understanding um, the challenges that uh, children face that live in Marin City, that we're a divided community between Marin City and Sausalito, but yet we are Sausalito Marin City School District. There's a, a, um, 
a, di a division um, that is very, you know, blatant. Um, mm -hmm. And that we need to, there needs to be some, some changes. But it's not just in the community of Marin City, it's in the county of Marin. There's some changes that need to happen so that we can um, start to actually uh, make a change with uh, the systemic racism that exists in our educational system here. Um, and so that being said, a couple years ago, um, I decided that I wanted to take action, that I wanted to be a part of the change that needs to happen. Um, and so I started to attend school board meetings. I started to really get involved um, with both schools. So with both, um, Martin Luther King, uh, Bayside, as well as Willow Creek Academy, which are the two schools that are uh, within the district in Marin City and Sausalito. Um, I actually first sat on the Willow Creek board. Um, and during that first year, um, you know, we were, we were challenged as a district. Um, we were mandated by the attorney, the state attorney general to um, desegregate uh, Martin Luther King school, which was, which is still predominantly um, comprised of black and brown children. And so, um, you know, I decided that I needed to do more, um, more than just sit on Willow Creek board. Um, I, while I was able to learn that our children at, at both schools were uh, failing were in, the, in the bottom 10%. Um, and I, when I say our kids, I'm meaning the black and brown kids were failing and that they, um, the support systems that were set um, were not making an impact. They were not, you know, our, our children just, you know, wasn't, aren't learning. They're just not learning. And so I decided I wanted to run for the Sausalito Marin City School Board last year. Um, and part of my message was we need to make some, some, some changes. We need to um, improve our classrooms, um, meaning we need to be able to provide equitable classrooms. We need to start early. We need to start um, making sure that our children know that they are valued, not just at, um, not just when they're in eighth grade or seventh grade, but this needs to start before they even get to kindergarten. This needs to start at an early age, pre-K. And so I wanted to make sure that I was involved in the, the policy development. I wanted to make sure that I was involved in the decision-making behind educating our children um, and moving past um, the, um, the, the whole image that our children can't learn, that our children um, aren't worthy of learning. Um, that our children should not be challenged. Um, and that, you know, what, you know the, the premise has been, you know, black children can't learn, you know, and they deserve to be in the 10%, you know, um, or that they, um, they shouldn't really um, uh, strive for better, you know? And so I wanted to be a part of that conversation um, I wanted to be a part, a part of the action of making the changes that we need to make within our educational systems. Um, and I wanna make sure that our children are just supported. Thank you, thank you, Alina. We've had the opportunity, the Emoji Equity Institute in our planning as one of our engagement uh, meetings uh, to meet with Trap to Vote. They've given graciously of their time on maybe three occasions and they take phone calls and they take uh, texts. Uh, so we really had the opportunity to emoji equity Institute. Let me get these two questions out here and do a bit of a round, a round table and people can jump in and we'll get back to a couple of other focus uh, pre-questions, which I've, I've given to you. One point, which I think was uh, that there are many diverse communities, but let's do these two first, meaning that defining equity, just give us a definition of, of equity, how you see it. Um, and we're moving around the horn and we'll get some people and some people won't. And then second of all, when we asked you, when the Emoji Equity Institute asked you to come to College of Marin to speak, why did you accept? You could have said, you know, uh, we don't know if it's any value of our time. Why did you accept the invitation? So those two 
two questions. I'll go first to uh, uh, Barry. No, 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 no. I want to pass it to Amber first. Let me let, pass let, it to let, Amber first. Amber, because I think she wants to also add into something. So roll it out, Am. Thank you, Barry. Um, I appreciate you. I think that actually what I was going to add to the earlier question can fit into my answer, which is that my late father, Kerry Pearson, one of my favorite quotes from him is that we have to acknowledge here in Marin and in this country that racism is not accidental. Mm. It was socially engineered. Mm. And um, first things first is that we have to acknowledge that. And the work that has to go into anti-racism means that we ha it has to be deliberate, it has to be radical, and it has to be looked at from a engineering perspective, from a social engineering perspective. And that goes back to the other question about some of the challenges we have in Marin. Um, homogeny is a problem. I you know, the context of my thinking around these issues is that racism is a disease. It should be classified along with narcissism, sociopathy, the denial for white people to sit in front of what is happening to black people, brown people, native people in this country and act like everything is an accident and like it's okay is an absolute disease. It is an intentional, it can be very good, well-intended people who can sit there and be observant of this without being able to know what to do. Because how do white people inform anti-racism when they are their neighbor to the left and their neighbor to the right looks just like them and lives just like them. Without diversity, it is hard to create the change that's necessary. And when we're such a small percentage, which for black people were less than 3% in this county, there is so much pressure on us to exist in all of the oppressive systems that have been designed to cause harm to us, that it becomes hard to survive it while teaching white people, while being activists, um, so anti-racism in this county is going to be look very different. It's going to need some outside support. It's going to need um, a lot of reflection. And it's going to honestly need some impersonal things, which I'll speak to later. But um, if racism is, is a disease, Marin County is one of the most infested places. Ooh. Definitely is in California based on the race count study, which is a study that was done um, out of Southern California on all, it was a non-biased study of the disparities in the different counties in California. And Marin got number one. We are the most despaired uh, county. We are, which basically, according to my father and, and I agree, it, it means we're the most racist county. So we, we are the biggest problem, but I always look at it as that also means we are the opportunity for the biggest solutions. Yes. And Absolutely. Why did I accept um, the invitation? One, Walter, it's because of you, because I highly esteem you. I learned so much in your class. And um, the other reason is because not only did College of Marin serve me, but education in general, whether fair or not, is the gateway to a better future. And College of Marin is really well placed because you're the gateway to higher education. You're the gateway to uh, the advancement of the individual and therefore the community. So there's so much opportunity here in terms of the radical change that I am speaking to. Woohoo! Okay. Yes, are, there others, are there other people who want to speak on that same question? Yeah. I don't know if the I don't know if the interpreter could interpret that woo I well, guess they can. All that. <laughs> so they can do slide. that. Is there somebody else that, did, did you want to weigh in on either of the points yeah, I raised me, about me, defining me equity? Me. Let me slide right in right quick. I know, I know, Amber, I, that, that's a lot of heat. So I'm going to kind of keep it brief, laid it out. Um, <laughs> yesterday was a monumental moment, right? Um, after 12 years pr prior to having a, the first black uh, president or the first president of color, so to speak, you now had a black woman um, being the first woman, first VP. We, when we talk about equity and equality, these things are symbolic. For some folks who will chew that up, they will say that's the equity, that's the equality, it's working. For a person like myself and my team, we're saying that's another symbolic gesture of progress that really is not dictating 
progress, but pandering to our emotions by saying this key phrase, first black. In 2021, when we're still celebrating being the first black anything, that's a problem. That does not balance when we talk about equity. That does not deliver equality because these things that happen so often that we're given symbolically usually looks like more of individual assets and that's not for the collective. So when we have dialed in in these conversations, the reason why I was so excited about being a part of this, one of my um, to-do list things was to always come back to Moraine because I felt the pain of being an African-American, not knowing who I was. Because not only do I identify as a black male, but I'm also Haitian. So that dynamic was delivering me from having to say, well, I'm Haitian, I'm not necessarily African-American, but African-American saying, you're not really black, you Haitian. And then white people looking at me like, you're black. So that whole self-division within our own culture created this idea that I didn't really have a place. So as I have felt so out of place and displaced, I've now found myself to be able to say, I'm a black man who is Haitian. And I've found that energy and I found that source of purpose. When I remembered what I grew up in, in Marin County, I said, there is no way that when I get to the levels of where my voice will be heard, I would not come back to this county that has given me so much love, but has given me so much hate at the same particular time. So it was an honor, not only to connect with my brothers and sisters as Trap the Vote, but an honor to say, finally, one of those plateaus that I reached for to be able to talk about the lack there of equity, the lack there of diversity, this idea that multiculturalism includes black when it really does say it discludes black. I was going to be um, the first one in line to say now I'm going to use my voice of power, my experiences of pain, not, of, not as anger, but as solution basis for us to move into what I believe is what we want to circle around is humanity. I want someone just to look at a black face as a human, not just as a black face and judge me by my character, not by my skin tone. Word, word. Word. Man, that... somebody, else want to add, somebody else want to add on that? You know, Bishlam, as we're going forward, uh, when we had the conversations with you, you raised the fact that you went to Marin for a period of time and then you stopped going to Marin. You became involved very much in the in the business community. And so you, you raised some points the last time we had a conversation about what College of Marin might be able to offer to people like yourself who had those type of interests because you've had a thriving business. You're from the Marin City community. You do a number of things to support uh, efforts in Marin City. In fact, I know that you've supported of the foundation here at College of Marin. Your, your thoughts, I, I wanna leave our, our staff and our faculty with some, these are things we can do. These are things we can dream about. Great, great. Uh, yeah, I'd love to tap in on that. I mean, College of Marin, let me, I'll, I'll say, uh, it was great to attend your classes. I was surprised that it was such a robust class that you had there. So that was always surprising to me, uh, which again, shouldn't have been surprising. And there was some support stuff there, there, but it was not, not in a way that I, that I could use. Um, uh, I, I think the College of Marin, as a business person in College of Marin, I think the College of Marin uh, has a great opportunity here to become aware, A, of who the black business owners are in Marin County and connect with them and therefore connect their students with them, uh, especially the ones that are more in the entrepreneurial spirit. It may not be as, uh, you know, connected to the, the academic versions of what College of Marin is offering. Um, I think that College of Marin has a great opportunity to create entrepreneurship uh, workshops, courses, classes, speakers that can come in such as myself um, and guide students that are coming directly out of Marin City um, into uh, running and owning businesses they don't, that don't necessarily have to do with uh, academic achievement. Um, I think that that's a really easy way for College of Marin to flex their 
uh, financial equity muscles as well as uh, their academic muscles, which they have access to. We know you guys have access. Um, so that would be something really easy to do through the Emoja Pro, uh, project. We could uh, create bridges uh, for students to get directly into business. As we all know, um, college is not necessarily on the academic side, the direct link for people to uh, achieve success financially or in the community. Um, sometimes they just need to understand what they're great at, focus on that, uh, get some equity, some finance and, and get straight to work so that they can do what I'm doing, which is you know in a position where I can go directly back to the community because I have time because I, I am successful in my business and I, I have room to go out and speak and, uh, and participate. So I, I encourage College of Marin to step up their, uh, their game when it comes to interacting with uh, Black people within business and entrepreneurship uh, in, in Marin County. We want to be able to live, work, own, uh, operate, and be visible in Marin. We don't want to have to hop somewhere else to, to, to succeed and do it. We, we, we grew up here. We earned our spot here. Our, our grandparents uh, uh, made it so that we could exist here. Uh, through through lots of trials and tribulations, uh, so we we are we are demanding that College of Marin recognize that we're demanding that you come into our community and um, and understand that uh, you can help us in, in a myriad of ways, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship and and, uh, and access to business equity. So that's what I'd have to say about that. You go ahead, Paul. Real quick, Walter. So there there are some things that we've discussed that we want College of Marin to be able to do some action some action items as we call them. Um, curriculum, dive into your curriculum, change it, um, have more activism and civil rights. So women, gender studies, um, look at racism as a disease, mm. have that discussion, bring right. in some black literature. Absolutely. You know, having more guest speakers, like Bishlam says, uh, let's figure out a way to get more black teachers, not just on college and Marin campus, but maybe y'all can influence, um, some black teachers to come to Marin in general. Uh, open up your campus to, 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 to black and brown organizations to make sure that we get more black faces on that campus, all of your facilities, everything from y'all state of art um, aquatic center, um, all the way down to your classrooms, you know, so, so black people can see their self in a college campus early in life. Um, create relationships with like Bayside, MLK, Willow Creek, and other schools that serve black kids to make sure that there's a connection. Um, one thing that we do know is that our educational system here in Marin City needs a little joke. So if we get some professors to help coach some of those teachers, then that could be a huge benefit. Um, all, so I'm, I'm on this new thing, looking for a research. I'm looking for somebody to do a case study. Absolutely. So reach out to UC Berkeley and some of your other partners to come and do a case study especially as it deals with Marin City and the, west, the rest of Marin County. Um, so we can look at damages, right? Mm -hmm. Because we do know that, you know, Marin City was established in the 1940s, but due to redlining, black people wasn't able to buy land outside of Marin City. <laughs> right? and so when you look at that, you know, if we had the same opportunities where our grandparents, if they, if they had the opportunity to go and buy land in Tipperon and other areas in Marin, it would have created generational wealth. So you can directly um, look at certain families and look at the progress because you could date it back. So it'd be wonderful to get somebody to come to get a, um, a university or college of Marin themselves to come in and do a case study um, and look at Marin City and its uh, totality and why it hasn't improved over the years like the rest of Marin has. Um, okay. We're talking about free education. Free education for black, black and brown students right here. Marin County has enough money, we can raise it. Talk to them. Um, housing for black students. I know that's one thing that I look at is how do we, how do we create housing for kids to really get um, a little bit of a college experience? Being able to leave your home and, because right now some kids just go to Santa Rosa just so they could leave the house and have a place to stay. So yep. college Marin has figured out a way to create um, housing um, for students. Um, in particular, black and brown students to, to come and live on campus, that'd be awesome. And then we talked about a, a infinity spaces, or affinity spaces, um, black wellness, workshops, tutorial, relaxing and organizing 
opportunities for people on campus just to feel like College of Moran is a place for them. So those are a few things that we discuss, and you know, we'll love to see College of Moran take some steps. Um, another one that I have a moderator because I'm running out of time here, and I can see that I have uh, about another ten minutes. I have like another uh, twenty minutes worth of questions, and they probably have another fifty or sixty minutes worth of of answers. Uh, Why don't you go? Uh, did were you on mic, Amber? Or let me let me throw a couple of things out there to see where we can. We can get one. I, I need to get out there. It was one of the pre questions I sent to you. And there was something you said to me, Amber, that has not left me since you said it. Um, and I'll say that after I say the question. The first thing was that you know, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and many of the others, some of their greatest support, some of their greatest magnetism came from the way in which brown and poor communities and immigrant communities uh, work with them and attach with them. So you've been doing that in Marin. I'm interested in the ways in which you build alliances with uh, Latinx communities, you build alliances with immigrant communities, you build alliances with people who are poor by class. I'm also interested in that. And, and Amber, the thing you said that stuck with me, I hope I can get back to Alina before we finish this. You were talking to me about, uh, talking to our group, not just to me, about the trauma. And you said, even after you come out and lobby around issues around equity and you go to the task force, then you stopped and you said, and then you have to go home. So yeah. let me throw those two things out there and let's see what we can get with that. Yeah, it's emotional labor. Like I spoke to it a little bit earlier. It's not easy being black and it's not easy being black and Marin, but it's not easy being black in general. We're, you know, when I see these men being killed by the police officers, I think of my son, or I think of the brothers on this panel. I think of so many men that I love, you know, as a woman, how often I feel unsafe to be expressive in certain spaces because of all of the ways that we're told that our emotions are uh, too extreme. There are so many ways that at the end of the day, I give all of this. I go and I make these alliances and I still go home to my blackness. We still go home. In a lot of ways, that's what's great about this group. These brothers hold me down and I hope I do the same for them. But, you know, it, in, for example, the time that I worked at TAM, well-intended white people, but the environment felt hostile to me because people couldn't see me or couldn't relate. That denial as a disease meant that my experience in a very, very passive conversation could sometimes feel like a, tiny, a thousand times cuts. And I had to go home with that. And I still had to earn money. So I still had to show up and I had to be graceful and I had to be polite and I had to not rock the boat. We as black people take the burden of white comfort by not discussing these issues that we have to exist in that we have to walk in and live in every day. And so right now, the challenge being what it takes to walk and chew gum, what it takes to exist in those systems, to be a regular human being, like Barry said, who's trying to be happy and have joy and have love in your life and pay your bills and eat good food and maybe lose a couple of pounds, whatever your issues, whatever you're personally going through in your body, and still give it to the world to point out all of these things are wrong. All of these things are dangerous and all of these things are a threat to me and my people. Okay, okay, let's keep moving. That question I asked about diverse communities and Alina said something when we met about, we have to start a lot earlier. If we could get some bounce around on those two, I would feel like I'd uh, uh, done my job today and the Emoji Equity Institute people would say something positive to me when this is over. <laughs> yes, um, uh, I just wanted just to say that we do have to start earlier. We have to start with um, the pre-K. We have to start with um, getting to know every child and celebrating their uniqueness, celebrating what they bring to the table, um, you know, making sure that we acknowledge challenges that may exist, challenges that are, um, that might come from their home life, that might, you know, come from, you know, what they're facing outside of school. Um, but we have to uh, recognize um, their culture, 
their languages that are spoken. Um, and we have to start that at an early age to make sure that uh, we are embracing all of them. Um, uh, adding into that, when we talk about education, right? Um, folks have to really understand and line this up. The, the idea of white superiority, it, it starts at an early age, but it's not even in a malicious way, right? When you think about it, when I was growing up in the 80s, I looked at all what was geared to me as being the superheroes. And I watched my Mel Gibsons, I watched my Sylvester Stallones, I watched my Arnold Schwarzenegger. I, I mean, all, I mean, Harrison Ford, I can go on to the list, the list, the list of these superheroes, these saviors. Even in a religion context, most of what I learned and grew up with, now that we've speeded up to folks kind of wanting to hear more of the truth, was that there was this white savior with blue eyes and, and, and the hair looking like the white counterpart that saved me from damnation. And it's not only being told in churches, but it's also being told in history books as when Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. So this whole time that this, this idea that white people are superior and then a white person would save me from whatever I feel that is my plight, it starts at an early age. So when a young person goes into school and preschool and they're told that your hero should be white, um, the savior religiously that created all is white, what will you look at as black? And then here comes the negative connotation of black. Bad guys wear black, bad luck, you walk by a black cat, it's black. <laughs> you know what I mean? You see an idea of when we wear white, it's righteous. You wear black, it's like, ooh, you set the mood, you're dangerous. And this is all at an early age and it's not social engineering that's ne honestly supposed to be negative, but it really is when, when you break down how it defines you after a while. I'm searching and I'm chasing for someone to save me when really in our reality, black people need to save ourselves because the truth is we are the creators of civilization. So how in the heck would I be looking at someone else to come save us when we created y'all? And I think that it starts stinging people when we start telling that truth. You know what the oldest continent in the world is, it's Africa. So how the hell could I be running behind a Caucasian or European when my ancestors civilized y'all? In the reverse, it's told to us at a young age, so it socially engineers us to already feel inferior, when in reality, we are superior. Check out our DNA. Our melanin will tell you that all by itself. So. I think when we really go into those uh, um, kind of frames and we really try to break down and tear back the lens of racism in America and why it still consistently exists, it's the idea of how do we um, now dissect the social engineering that was done because the lack there of education, the lack there of truth at a younger age. When you look at all points, rock and roll, if I didn't know my history, I would have thought Rat or Poison or Bon Jovi created it. But it was the black people that created it because MTV is showing me a whole bunch of rock and rollers. And I'm just confined to believe like, well, shoot, Bon Jovi create, created rock. The realities that we face every day as black people is that not only are we isolated, but we are erased from history. And we're erased from good history. And I think that when you continue to see black people in these unfor unfortunate predicaments, and I'll even look at it in the Black Panther movie that just recently came out, even in a Black Panther movie that showed all black people being heroes, all black people winning, you know what was defined? There was a white savior that saved us ultimately from damnation at the end. And that's kind of where we are. White people have to take away this idea of savior 
take this idea of by serving or doing good, like I've been talking to some of the people in the chat, this is just the right thing to do. This ain't got nothing to do with charity. We are behind the eight ball because we're behind the eight ball because it was done on purpose. This is, wasn't a mistake that we made. It was a mistake that your ancestors made. Your privilege is a privilege that was sold in America long before you even knew what privilege was. So don't be mad at the effects of it. And you cannot be upset when we call it out. And when you sit there and say to us as black people that that was old and it happened a long time ago, it doesn't matter now. I then know you are not prepared for the truth. I then know you are not truly my ally. I then know you want to be comfortable the way America is. Because in California, affirmative action was not passed. Let's, let's, let, me, let me say that one more time. In California, affirmative action was not passed. That falls into our white counterparts looking at their group, looking at what they're willing to give up to equal the playing field. And I'm going to stop at that point. I, there'll be workshops. I think Beth will be coming on and be sharing uh, information with you about the workshops coming up. Uh, which will go from 11 to 12. Uh, and you'll find that there'll be one you can look on your uh, login. Uh, thank you, Alina. Thank you, Bishlam. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Amber. All College of Marin students, uh, they're all from College of Marin. Uh, they got this knowledge from uh, their experiences at College of Marin. And I do hope, as I conclude here, thank you so much from the Emoja Equity Institute. Uh, we have some things in place, as I announced in the intro, uh, I think will make a difference. And I do hope and pray uh, that we'll be able to live up to your expectations and your demands about what we do here on our campus. But thank you so much. We're honored. Uh, let, me jump, let, let me jump in here real quickly. And this is what I dislike about this format the most is that you can't hear the appreciation that I know and the applause, the thunderous applause that's out there. <laughs> So please know that we all very much appreciate you. I want to say specifically to Barry, Amber, Paul, Bishlam, and Alina as myself, that thank you for sharing your experiences and your truths. I, you know, the words I wrote down, rich, enlightening, thought-provoking. I ought to tell you that what I most appreciate is uh, thank you for calling us out and for calling us to action. So I really greatly appreciate that. And Walter, thank you. Big thanks to you for your excellence uh, teeing up of the, of the presentation, your facilitation. And of course, your overall leadership in this important work. So with that, now I want to introduce uh, Beth Patel, uh, who is our, uh, the chair of our professional learning committee. Hi, thanks, Hi. David. And thank you so much to the panel. Uh, wow, there was so much passion there and definitely a great call to action. Um, I just want to encourage everyone right after we end, we'll be immediately moving into three different breakout sessions. And we've got three groups that are organized that'll be sharing with us some more with uh, the panelists that we've been he hearing from today. The first group has to do with community organizing and activism. Uh, if you wanna hear Barry preaching a bit more, come on into that group, cause he's gonna be there with us along with Bishlam. Our second group has is about future visions for Marin County. Uh, Paul and Amber will be in that group. And finally, the last one is your in seat of influence, uh, talking about how we might be able to transform educational policy and work toward equity in Marin County. And Alina will be with that, be in that group. If you'll take a look in your chat box, uh, they have posted the Zoom links for all three of those. So you can copy the Zoom links from the chat box. They're also available in Pro Learning as well. So you can do that. Um, and before we break off though, I wanna take just a moment and give a huge shout out to uh, everyone who has participated in our Flex Week activities this week. We started off on Tuesday with a great showing in some of our sessions, and I really appreciate all of the attendance that we've had, and particularly for those presenters among our uh, among our faculty and staff who have led out in those. Uh, we always have some great sessions, and really, it's all due to the work of our of our colleagues here at the college. And with that, I would like to say uh, best wishes for the new semester, and uh, look forward to hear look forward to working with everyone about how we can move some of these ideas into action over the next semester. Thank you very much. Thank you.
And with that, I believe that concludes our convocation for spring 2021. Thank you everybody for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.